I think I was, uh, I don't know, about a middle school student. The first time I made any kind of um, concerted effort to read the Bible. Um, I was involved in my youth group growing up, local church, and my youth pastor, like, like I did when I was a youth pastor, tried to encourage students to familiarize themselves with the Bible and to give them a background and an understanding of what the Bible is and why it's foundational in your faith. So like I approached every other book that I'd ever been given and that I'd ever read, I started at the beginning, right? Many of you maybe can relate to this, but I, I Genesis went okay. Like there was some stuff that I was familiar with, stories and experiences that I'd heard before. And so I felt some level of kind of like, Okay, I'm tracking with this a little bit. You get into Exodus, and I knew about Moses. So like for the first um, good chunk of that, I, I kind of felt like I at least had something, but it felt like the connection was becoming a little more challenging. This is happening, of course, I'm, I'm maybe like 12 years old. So this is over the course of weeks. I'm trying to read a little bit every day, maybe a chapter, maybe two, that sort of thing. And then, um, and then, I, I stayed committed through the point of Exodus and I got to Leviticus, right? You ever got to Leviticus, right? I'm not the only one. And I, I remember like, it's just, this is just one example. I'm just going to throw this one out here for you. But this is from um, Leviticus chapter 13. I don't have this on the screen, um, but this is, uh, this is at the end of the chapter, verse 47. And this is regulations about defiling molds, Okay. So uh, as for any fabric that is spoiled with a defiling mold, any woolen or linen clothing, any woven or knitted material of linen or wool, any leather or anything made of leather, if that affected area in the fabric, the leather or the woven or knitted material or any leather article is greenish or reddish, <laughs> it is a defiling mold and must be shown to the priest, right? And I'm trying, I'm, I'm t good, 12 years old, I'm trying to work my way through this. I've got this high view of the Bible and what it is and what it's for. And so I'm like plowing through and I'm like, what? Like what, why do I need to know about defiling molds? Like what is, what is the purpose of this? Why is this important? What is going on here? And I, I had no context for where Leviticus was written, why it was written, what was going on. I actually have an appreciation for the book of of Leviticus now because I understand it in the greater narrative, but as a middle school student trying to approach the Bible from this front to back sort of understanding that, that it, was, it was frustrating because I was overwhelmed. In fact, Leviticus is, is kind of what caused me to give up on it. I think I went back to the Gospel of John and just said, I'm going to stick with something a little bit more mold irrelevant, you know? <laughs> And I think that question is familiar to many of us. Like that, that's just the beginning, right? When we think about what's in the pages of the Bible, we discover story after story, experience after experience of the extraordinary, of, of the supernatural, sometimes even the difficult or the grotesque. There are bodies of water that are drying up and, and entire nations of people crossing across on dry land, and that happens more than once. We see the story of, of a prophet who is fleeing from God and who is thrown out of a boat, swallowed by a fish, whole, stays alive in his belly for three days and then is vomited back up on dry land. We hear of a shepherd boy who, who is called from his father's fields where he's tending a flock and who is willing to step out and go against Israel's greatest military enemy, their, their most superior warrior, and defeats him with a slingshot. We see moments when rocks produce water where the people of Israel wake up and across the landscape, it's filled with, with bread to provide the substance where God is providing for them as they wander around the desert for 40 years. We see instance after instance where people who are dead are raised back to life. We see example after example where the men and women who are so foundational in, in the story of our faith seem to make every mistake, where they, they, they commit every sin possible with one very notable exception. 
that we get to later in the story. In all of this, the, the story continues to advance. We get to the, the pinnacle, the climactic moment, the story of a, a Jewish rabbi who grew up as a, a peasant in a small town, who, who has a teaching and a following and people begin to respond to and he's eventually deemed to be this threat to the, the religious power structures of the day. He's deemed ultimately to be a threat to, to the power of Rome. He endures a, a mock trial and is crucified as a result of it. He's laid down in a tomb. All these followers who have been listening to him scatter. They leave in fear. Some of them even deny ever knowing him. And this movement that people have been following, all these teachings about the kingdom of God that he is ushering in, all of it is silenced, at least for three days. And then once again, there's this, this incredible story of resurrection, of life, or of death being defeated and life being restored. And all of these people, all the ones who have scattered in fear, the ones who have ran and hid, they, these followers of Jesus, they now commit their life to the cause of telling people who he is and what he's done, that he is in fact the savior of the world. It's an, it's an incredible story. It's compelling and it's inspiring. But is it true? Is, is it a story that we can trust? Is, is, it, is it spiritual mythology tended to teach us important life lessons or is it God's story intended to transform us? This is the question that we want to explore today as we look at the simple question, is the Bible reliable? Is the Bible reliable? And I think that this is an absolutely critical question in this ongoing discussion that we've been having over the course of the last six weeks together. And no small part because in my attempts to address these questions from a Christian worldview, the majority of the time I'm attempting to make my case from the perspective of what the Bible tells us as it relates to these questions. And I, I'm coming, and I'll be totally honest with you, I'm coming from the perspective that the Bible is, is authoritative, author, an authoritative source of truth. So if we don't have resolution as it relates to this question, then all of the other questions that we've been seeking to address, that we've been talking about, otherwise it's difficult to find resolution in those as well. This, this question is foundational. It's critical to the whole conversation. That being said, however, I, I, I want to tell you, and I've said this throughout this series, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover everything that I would love to cover as it relates to this topic today. So I'm not, I'm not going to get into how we, how we got the Bible, how the Bible was formed, or even really a thorough discussion on what the Bible is. In fact, I'm not even going to really go into um, all the evidence that, that, that shows us or talks about the reliability of the Bible from like a textual perspective or um, an archeological perspective. I'm not gonna get into the manuscript evidence that's out there. I'm not gonna get into the, the, the prophetic evidence, which I think is, is, all of that is actually very compelling stuff. And there's a lot that we could talk about. What I will do, however, is I am gonna post a video on our Chapel Street Church Mill Creek Facebook page. Pastor Jeff and Laura, just about uh, last spring, did a series called Intro to the Bible, and the first session of that dealt in depth, or more in depth, with a lot of these questions. I know they felt like, there was like an hour and 45 minutes, and they felt like they didn't have nearly enough time. But if you're interested in that, you can go back and watch that. I'm going to post as well a five-minute video by The Bible Project that just talks about what the Bible is that I think is really, really helpful in, in understanding how we approach this book. But for our purposes here today, what, what I would like to do is to address, I think, three of the primary questions that when, when, when I'm engaging in conversation with people, when I'm talking about an understanding of the Bible and the objections that they might have with the Bible, I think that these questions speak so often to the central issues that they're, they're asking. And kind of the, the logic that I'm using here comes from a book written by Timothy Keller called The Reason for God. And he goes into a lot more detail about this, but we're going to look at the historical question, we're going to look at the cultural question, and we're going to look at the personal question. 
So let's begin by considering the historical question. The historical question. When I was a, a youth pastor in Wheaton in the early 2000s, um, Dan Brown's book, uh, um, The Da Vinci Code, came out. And if you know anything about that book, Brown sort of creates a scenario where Jesus is, is a, a great influential teacher, but that's, that's all he is. And he cites these references in the Gnostic Gospels suggesting that after his death, the story of who Jesus is has been coerced by, by Constantine and Rome and by the early church in order to consolidate their power in order to kind of control over the people. And, and this, this novel, like there's been other books written that suggest similar things, but this, this novel became so mainstream, it became so popular, and lots of students were writing it, was, uh, reading it. It was a compelling story. And we had done something similar to explore God with this youth group in Wheaton that we used to call Coffeehouse Conversations. And in that particular year, this was the prevailing question that students wanted to know over and over and over again is have we been listening to the wrong version of the story? H have we been listening to, to a, a manufactured tale? Is there any historical evidence that, that what the Gospels are telling us is true? They're, they're essentially asking this question and it's a fair and important question. Oftentimes this historical question gets framed something like this. It says, Aren't the New, Testable, uh, the New Testament Gospels more of a religious legend than they are a historical narrative? I think that's certainly the case that, that Dan Brown seems to make in his book. And there's a couple things that I just want to, to speak to as it relates to this. And it really relates to why I think Scripture can be understood. And I'm talking particularly right now about the Gospels as, as historical narrative. And the first thing I would like to, to um, ask you to consider, to have you consider, is, is the proximity. Is the issue of proximity. And by that I mean for, for an event or a, a, per, a person to, to take on legendary status in, in history. Typically there has to be enough distance between the event or the life of the person and the creation of the legend. But what's unique about the New Testament is that these books were written, specifically the gospel, somewhere between, on, on a later side of thing, between 40 and 60 years after the death of Jesus. So that means that, that as a result of that, they were written in a time within a generation wherein people were still alive who witnessed the things that are written there. In fact, the apostle Paul, who wrote about two thirds of our New Testament, some of his letters, which refer to the life of Christ, to his death and to his resurrection and to his teachings, those are written within 15 years of the, the death of Christ. And so for it to be legend, it, it, there's not enough gap between the actual historical events that are taking place and, and a legend to be created because it's taking place within a single generation of those people that were there. Which, which sort of brings me to my second thing for, for us to consider. And that is simply that the Gospels provide eyewitness accounts. The Gospels are, are by their own, their own declaration, are eyewitness accounts of what took place during the life and times of Jesus. It's a firsthand knowledge. So um, as you guess, Matthew and Mark are, are, and John are written by people that were there. Luke, when he's writing his gospel, was not there. He's a friend of, of Paul, but he says, I've gotten all this information because I've sat down with the people who were there. In fact, turn real quickly to Luke chapter 1. This is how he begins. He, he's careful to make a point of this. This is how he begins his, his gospel account. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who, were who, by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So, so 
Luke is writing with a specific purpose of providing an accurate account of what, what he's done. And he cites the fact that his information is coming from his interviews and connections with people who are eyewitnesses to it. Now, this is important. Anybody can claim that, right? Anybody could just say, well, I, ta I talked to eyewitnesses. But again, this, when you compare it with the proximity, they're, they're living in the time, Luke is writing this in a time where it would have been possible, particularly for opponents of, of the message of Christ, which there was plenty at this time, to go and say, that's not the account that these people have. You claim all these things. You claim that, 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 that he walked on water and that he rose from the dead. And, and we've got all these people that were there in that moment. They heard him teach and they said none of that ever happened. But Luke in his case to Theophilus is saying, I've gotten all of this from eyewitness account. Paul, in fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians, he, he's talking about the central fun, foundational aspect of the Christian faith, the resurrection. And this is what he says. This is from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So he says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So Paul is saying on this, this central issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul is saying, don't just take my word for it. Ask the people who saw him. There's, there's 500 plus of them. Most of them are still living. Talk to them. See their account of it. See, you can't cite eyewitnesses as, as strength for your case if it's impossible for people to go talk to those eyewitnesses. Paul is not afraid of, of, of the truth. He's not afraid of what people are going to discover. He encourages it, in fact. Go talk to them. Hear the story for yourself. Thirdly, then, I think, and as it relates to this question of historicity, um, is that the, this, the Bible narrative, the gospel narrative, does not, it does not hide the flaws of, of the critical characters. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seek to, and this is unique if you're, if you're creating legend, Right? The, the Bible, and, and Brian does a good job of noting this, but the, the Bible is, is honest about the, the men and the women who have, were close to Jesus, who followed him, and so many of them who, who messed things up. Like when you're trying to manipulate a narrative for the purpose of creating a movement, you don't typically make the primary voices of your movement um, deniers. You don't, you don't reveal them to be petty and jealous with each other. You, you don't, in the first century, you don't make the hero of your story, the central character, die on a Roman cross. Like, th that was offensive to everyone who would have heard it. You don't do that unless that's true. You don't make the very first witnesses to a resurrected Jesus a group of women coming to the tomb in a society and a culture that so had such a low status of women that they weren't even allowed to testify in, in the court of law. You would never do that and, unless, of course, that's how it happened. You don't make the, the primary voices, the closest followers of Jesus, the chief takers of the med message the, the deniers and, and, and living in fear. You don't put them in conflict with each other throughout the story unless that's who they were and that's how they acted. Certainly, if you're Peter and you're trying to create legend, you're trying to manipulate the narrative, you don't include the part about denying the fact that you ever knew him. You would never incorporate that into the story. But, but the Bible is honest. Honest. 
about these people. It's honest about the story, and it's honest about the flaws. And I think that's evidence. I think that suggests that this isn't, this isn't legend. It's, it's, it's history. It's, it's truth. Lastly, then, and just real quickly on this point, and this is really just kind of a, a, a literary um, reference, but there is all kinds of detail given throughout the New Testament. You can look in John chapter 1 when they're out in their boats and they pull in this hull of fish and it tells you exactly how many fish they caught. You could look in John chapter 4 where Jesus is on a boat and it tells you where he's sleeping at and, and where he's, he's resting. That sort of, of specific detail is, is really a modern realistic fiction um, genre. So saying that if you were to create, write this as, as legend, as fiction, that does not fit with the literary styles of that time. In fact, that style of writing is really about two or 300 years old. When you look back at the Iliad or, or Homer's Odyssey or those sorts of things, you don't find that kind of detail given around non-critical elements or, or aspects that's only written in historical narrative. And yet that is, that is throughout the, the pages of Scripture. And, and here's the point. Again, all of this is just evidence to consider. But I would suggest that a careful study of the text of the New Testament does not suggest that this is written as legendary narrative. But rather it is designed to, not to con uh, convince us of fictitious events, but it is designed rather to, con to convict us of accurate and historical count of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, of, of the men and women who followed him, who believed his message to be true, and they wanted to tell the story. The second question that emerges in, as it relates to the reliability of the Bible so often is the question of, is, is what I'm calling the cultural question. And it's really the question of things that we read in the pages of, of the Bible that just don't sit right with us. In fact, there's a, uh, out in Southern California, there's a large church out there. And every year in the summer, they, they rent out Angel Stadium out in Anaheim. And they'll do this big sort of almost Billy Graham style crusade. Uh, I think over 100,000 people over the course of three days will come and hear speakers and and hear the gospel preached, and they will advertise this throughout their community, invite people to come and be a part of it. And, and um, the last summer, there was some controversy around this, not because of anything that was happening at the event or that took place there, but because of, of the billboards that they used to invite people. And one of the billboards that they rented out had a person sitting in their chair holding their Bible. And the mere image and presence of the Bible on these billboards by some was deemed to be offensive. In fact, the marketing company that owned the billboards received multiple calls from people asking them to take down those pictures of this guy holding the Bible because in there, and this is a quote, they deemed it as a serious threat. Just, just the picture of the Bible. Because what's inside of it to many is viewed as, especially through the lens of of our own culture, our own worldviews is deemed offensive. Just two weeks ago, we were discussing the question of is Christianity too narrow? Some people find the words of Jesus. This is in Jesus in John chapter 14. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me. Some people hear those words and say that's offensive. That's, that's exclusionary and elitist. And so subsequently, then they take the message of the Bible as, as being authoritative or truthful, and they dismiss it altogether. Others will point to um, cases where polygamy takes place in the Old Testament and suggest that God is advocating for or allowing room for multiple wives in his design of, of marriage, and they come to a similar conclusion. There are any number of issues throughout the pages of the Bible that when taken from the point of view of, of our culture, seen through that lens, that, that, are, that feel to us to be offensive. And again, I would argue that I think it's really critical that, we don't, that we're not dismissive of this argument. Because I think that only serves to, to validate this felt objection. 
Again, there's just a couple things I wanna, I wanna highlight real quickly on, on this point. First is, is that it's important for us to recognize and to understand that at the heart of this story, at, at the message of, uh, that is communicated in the ministry of Jesus is the harsh reality that we are all messed up. That, that the condition that we live in is, is that we aren't good enough and that we're flawed as a result of sin. And the message of the gospel is that, that God in his love for us has come to overcome all of that, but it starts at the point of offense. It brings us face to face with a, a spiritual reality that, that, that to be honest, many of us don't like confronting. I don't like confronting it. I don't like hearing that about myself, becoming aware of it. See, the thing about the gospel message is that before it saves us, it offends us, Right? And so there is something to this that we need to recognize and be honest about and truthful in. But second, when we're looking at these subject matters that we see sometimes throughout the pages of the Bible that don't sit well with us, that don't, don't, that don't in our culture seem to make sense, there's a couple things I would like to encourage you. And again, I'm taking this, this portion of this from, from Keller's logic in A Reason for God. But he suggests three things. He says, first, consider your own, uh, uh, consider the entire context. And what he means by that is he means that, that oftentimes we look at a phrase or a verse in the Bible and, and we make some assumptions about what it's saying and we don't look at it in the context of the greater narrative when it's really not saying that. If you take the example of polygamy that, we, that I referenced earlier. Where when you look at the whole story, the whole aspect of, of marriage throughout the narrative, where it begins in Genesis with a man and the woman in the garden, where it's set apart as sacred, and, and what Jesus teaches about it in the New Testament, in the, in the in-between, the cultural norm in that day was polygamy. In fact, scripture, the story of the people of Israel and, the, and what God is doing is actually working against that, but it's un undeniable that there's critical leaders in the history of Israel who have multiple wives. And, and every example that you see of that in the Old Testament, it doesn't end well. Like it doesn't become something that is good, that's something that, that you see like, well, that really worked out well for that person. And you always see that when it's outside of God's design, without exception, there's something that goes wrong in the plan. So it's this example of what's happening in culture and how even God's people have adapted that. And yet every single time it ends up being a mess. There's times when Jesus is, is talking to his disciples and he says, if you don't hate your father and mother, if you don't hate brother and sister, if you don't even hate your own life, you're not worthy of following me right? Jesus is not advocating emotional hate for your parents. He's, he, he is telling you what it looks like to be wholly committed to Jesus. So we have to understand these things in the context in which they were written. Secondly, then Keller encourages us to, to consider our own cultural biases, right? Our own, the own lens that we look at. Every culture, every generation views the lens in which they see the world to be superior to those who've gone before them. This is like, uh, like, like mom goggles, right? Like my mom, growing up, my mom always used to try to encourage me to uh, sing. Like she would always be like, you should do like a solo in church and things. I can't sing, people. Like there's nothing, I, I, I can't hit a note, like I can't, none of it works for me. I like to. It's good, but and somehow what came out of my mouth and my mom's mind got translated through her love for me and sounded like beautiful music. So much so that she felt like I should, should share it with the world. And, and this, is, this is Keller's point here, is that when we view our own cultural lens as the source of authority in, in how we view everything else, um, we carry that bias in with us. And he's saying just at least be willing to consider, as you, can, as you look at these matters, the bias of your own culture. And then thirdly, and I think this is really essential, Keller reminds us to start with what's central. Many, many times in, um, throughout my life as a pastor and conversations I've had, I've, I, especially in student ministry, I'd 
get into conversations and, and, and people that were searching and seeking would have all kinds of questions, good questions. We'd sit down at Starbucks or somewhere and, and they'd wanna know about the creation narrative in Genesis and how does that reconcile with science and what's going on there. And they would have a million different questions and at some point in time in the conversation, I, wanted, I would always say, look, those are all valid and those are all important. Can we just, I wanna talk to you about where do you stand on who Jesus is and, and, and what he's done and the historicity of the resurrection. Let's, let's start there. Let's start with what's central, what's foundational and fundamental. And it's not that we're dismissive of all these other issues. There are issues that even Christians debate and talk about all the time that we aren't all in agreement on. But we don't want to lose what's foundational and fundamental to deal with what's secondary. And so Keller would encourage us and he reminds us to focus on that. In fact, he writes this, he says, to stay away from Christianity because, of, because part of the Bible is offensive to you assumes that, that if there is a God, that he wouldn't have any views that upset you. And he says, does that belief make sense to you? I think that's a fair question. Thirdly, then I want us to consider the personal question. The personal question. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul's writing to a young leader in the church by the name of Timothy, and he wants to encourage him about his own understanding of what the Bible is, is useful for, why he needs it. Um, this is what he writes. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back a verse earlier. This won't be on your screen, but this is 15. And it says, and how, he's talking to, uh, talking to Timothy, how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when Paul, when Paul describes the usefulness of scripture, he's referring to the Torah in the Old Testament here, but he's talking about this in, in Timothy's life. He says, this is, it's useful for things like correcting us and rebuking us, and training us, and teaching us. And this is, Paul doesn't give us an exhaustive list of all that scripture does, but what he does give us is the reality that the part of, of what he wants Timothy to understand, what he wants the followers of Jesus to understand, is that this was written as an authority in our lives, in the lives of those who claim to, to follow Jesus. And this is, this is the difficulty, the challenge for us. This is as much of a question for many of us who have, who have placed our faith in Jesus for years as it is for the person who is still wrestling with that question. And that is that, am I willing to, to submit to a source of authority that's greater than myself? Just over the last few years, um, I, I was sort of reinitiated in a, a search of or desire to understand um, how scripture speaks into a very relevant question that our society is asking right now. And I'm not going to tell you what the question is. I don't want, I don't want to get distracted by what the question is, but I, I went on this pursuit of really trying to understand and study scripture and, and think about it thoughtfully and, and what my own convictions were as it relates to this. And, and I noticed as I was reading is that I had an idea in mind, a conclusion that I wanted to get to like a, a destination. I knew kind of what I was hoping it was going to say sort of thing. And, and I had to battle every step of the way as I was kind of engaging in this study to check my own heart and say, God, don't, don't take me, don't allow me to just arrive. Don't let me shape this into what I believe and what I want it to say, but have this shape me. And I had to say that every time I read and every time I went into the study, because I could see in my own will and my own heart, my desire to just superimpose me over the message that God wanted to give. And it was a challenge for me and it was difficult. See, but what, once again, what makes, what makes everything the, that we've talked about over these last six weeks relational is the fact that this is God who is, is seeking to connect us, to, to train us, to grow us. I'm not going to lie to you. There, there are things in the Bible that are difficult 
There are things that we don't like to hear. It asks hard things from us. Things like loving our enemies. Things like living generously. Things like dying to selves. It isn't easy and it's not comfortable. But its source is a loving God who invites us into relationship with him. See, the personal question that we wrestle with is is a question of the will. Can I believe in a God who is allowed to contradict me, to instruct me? Or can I only believe in a God where I am allowed to pick and choose? A God of my own making, a God where, where ultimately I become the ultimate source and final authority. Again, Keller writes this, and I'll I'll, I'll close with this. He says, only if your God says things that outrage you and make you struggle, will you know that you've gotten a hold of a real God and not a figment of your imagination. He says, so an authoritative Bible is not the enemy of a personal relationship with God. It is a precondition for it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity just to be in your word this morning, Lord, and I pray that you would continue to show us more of you as it relates to how we've been, um, what you've left for us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me and I'll offer this morning's benediction. As always, our prayer team will be available. If there's anything that we can be praying for you or with you, um, we'd love to do that. It's an honor. We'll be up front, um, and you can uh, feel free to find one of us. Um, and, uh, and drive safe as you go home today, okay? Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who is on every page of the story, who is, is God's provision and solution to our greatest need. May we discover him there. And may we do life with him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.